Breaking the cycle to step forward. Authentic conversations from lived experience and a professional perspective in overcoming abuse with Chris Tuck and Beverly Ann. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Breaking the Cycle to Step Forward podcast with myself, Chris Tuck, and the lovely Beverly Ann. Hello. And today's podcast is all about adult safeguarding and we are calling it the recovery roller coaster now let me just set the scene a little bit and then i'll come to beverly for her views on this subject so adult safeguarding it's national adult safeguarding week and this podcast will be released at the end of this week and it's all about protecting an adult's right to live in safety free from abuse and neglect so safeguarding adults is all about preventing harm reducing the risk of abuse or neglect to adults with care and support needs and stopping abuse and neglect wherever possible so really it's the same as safeguarding children but obviously adults so what does that bring to mind for you Bev? With all of this this is fantastic and I'm really really you know, appreciative of these different events coming up because it enables these conversations to be opened. But there's something that I'm always reflective of because, yes, when we're aware of someone being vulnerable, when somebody needs support, yes, we can action that. But I like to go a little bit underneath because I know from my own lived experience, I would never have classified myself as a vulnerable adult years ago. However, I was very much a vulnerable adult and I didn't know how to ask for support. And to the outside world, I didn't look vulnerable and yet I was. Okay, can you give us some more details? Absolutely. So, you know, we all know that I've got childhood experiences, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, being in out of um, care, etc., But I also remember being in my early 20s and reading all these um, other stories and not realising or not having the knowledge of knowing the impact that had of me. So although I wanted to change my life and I knew that I could have choices, you know, now I'm an adult at 16. (laughs) Now I'm an adult, I'm going to change my life and I'm going to go forward. That was done, yeah, you know, that was my survival instinct. But what I hadn't realised was how it's going to impact on me. And that meant when I was making my choices, so establishing a relationship, I didn't actually understand about boundaries. I didn't understand about healthy relationship because I didn't know that. I hadn't, yeah. been, I hadn't learned that growing up as we assume everybody does. Yeah. And it's that assumption we make. So when I was in what I considered a really loving relationship I didn't realize at that time it wasn't loving it was control Mm -hmm. and if I said something that wasn't liked there would be a consequence yeah and I remember when I started my own recovery you know after having children I've realized you know I was getting night terrors etc I was ready to enter recovery And that was a little bit of double-edged sword because I started having counselling and support for my childhood. But that meant even the person that I was with at that time in that relationship, they didn't want it. And I had the biggest argument ever after my first session of counselling. They didn't want you to have the counselling. Yes. Interesting. Why? Yeah. Well, the things that came up was, why do you want to talk about something that happened years ago? And and you can imagine how I would have reacted to that as well, because that means being vulnerable and sharing something in an environment I didn't feel was safe. Yeah. Um, and so why would I want to talk? Also, the, what I'm hearing, the messages, why do you want to talk about something that happened years ago? And yet I'm feeling the impact of it. So this is where the roller coaster starts. Because mm-hmm. if you think of it, I always liken it in myself. I'd gone to the fairground. Mm-hmm. like So I'd found the courage to reach out for support because I, I needed it and I realised I needed it. 
I'd got into the carriage, started the journey, and straight away I was getting the backlash for wanting it mm. and needing it. What was your then partner saying to you? Why did they not want you to have this new knowledge? I think it, I didn't know at the time, but if I was to look back now, I think it's fear, fear of the unknown, you know, and so fear of, you know, what is it I'm going to unravel? What is it I'm going to talk about? And even though they'd been very good when I did disclose that I'd had, you know, I'd been sexually abused by my dad because I never spoke about the other person, they they were really supportive then. But to go and get support, that's the fear of the unknown. In fact, the words were said, you don't need to speak to a stranger. You can speak to me. And I said, but so there was... your partner said this to you. Yes. Right. Um, and also that meant that as I was going through recovery and as I was finding out different things about myself, etc., that person through their fear, and I do believe it was fear, um, I can't answer that one, that person would need to answer it, mm -hmm. but um, uh, all I can say is the more I was getting support and help, the more that person became very challenging and it turned into, um, yeah, there was a physical abuse that followed that. Right. I'm really sorry about that. Yeah. Um, I often hear from other adult victim and survivors, that individuals that we work with, once they start getting help and support, their awareness increases, some of the relationships do break down because the partner's husbands wives don't understand um that this person is now moving on and growing and sometimes they don't actually like that they feel like they're being left behind and so it's really important that if you are an individual that is in a protected loving safe relationship that as you do go through your recovery journey whatever that looks like that you consider communicating what's going on for you with the loved one in your life so that you can take them with you that sounds fantastic absolutely but not everybody's in that that 100%. place to be able to do it so yeah. and that's what's lovely about these conversations because mm -hmm. let's be frank you know that would be the ideal the perfect ideal and in yeah. all fairness I did think that as well but it's when we look at, you know, the safeguarding, it really, you know, I look back now with hindsight and think, well, I didn't realise how vulnerable I was as an adult. And it was... Explain more. Well, it was only in the end the relationship did break down. Yeah. I was living on my own. But there was still this... Um, I left a very abusive relationship and didn't realize at the time but it was yeah. somebody else who'd been through it and it wasn't that I'd said anything it was obviously she was watching different things and she gave me um, a leaflet about domestic abuse and I was like mm -hmm. no I've I've left him but then it was only as I read the information I was like oh oh I'm still being threatened that still comes into domestic abuse oh, I can get help. And it meant that I did get support from the police. But if I hadn't realised that, I would never have got support. And this is a double-edged sword for me at the time back then of recovery. Recovery was great because it, it was releasing me. But it was also for a while putting me in danger. But then because somebody gave me the knowledge and the information, and that's why we have these weeks for safeguarding weeks have these conversations I was able to learn more and ask for the support and say I need help you know often society in general will look at a woman or a man that's in a domestic violence relationship once they know about it and they say why didn't the person the victim leave sooner especially if there's children involved and we have busted this myth time and time again. Um, my mum 
was in two domestic violent relationships and she uh, left the first one, found the courage when there was no refugees around. So 1977, she left that abusive relationship. Um, but then she went and got with another man that was just as abusive to her. And she knew she was being abused. But her words to me, when I tried to offer her a way out so many times, she said, bet all the devil I know than the devil I don't. I know what this relationship looks like. I know how to handle the situation. I know how to calm the waters. But that world outside of this world that I know is too scary. And she could never make the leap. Never. I mean, my mum's died now, but she could never do the leap, even though she knew what was happening to her was it was wrong. What was being perpetrated against her was wrong. She knew that, but she couldn't leave. And I know many women or men who are in a DV relationship, they find it really difficult. But us on the outside, we can really be very judgmental and go, if I was in that situation, I would have left. Oh, and I now know from listening to others and reading more about it, that it isn't just as easy as just leave. It just no. isn't. We know there's more danger, don't we, involved? Absolutely. And if anyone's watching this, they'll see that I smiled when you were talking about your mum. I'm smiling because, yeah, I, I really understand that. And one of the things that I used to say, this is good as it gets. And if I'm really honest, there was a part of me, you know, that like, Obviously, I didn't necessarily feel worthy back then. You know, I was still carrying shame. I was carrying guilt. So From the childhood stuff, let alone yes, the relationship. Exactly. So this is as good as it gets. And I really believe this is. And also because of what I'd gone through, the last thing I wanted was my children to come from a relationship that broke up. I wanted right. to do the best. And I, and I kept thinking it was me. I'm the one. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that needs Something to fix me yeah. yeah and if I if I look at myself and and try and make things you know I felt damaged I mean mm -hmm. I'd actually heard that word professionally yeah so that's one of those things that the words that gets my goat but that's the message that I took so I thought if I fixed myself I could be a proper mum I could be a proper wife do you see what I mean and wow. it's not I can be honest about that now because now I've come through the tunnel. I'm in a love. I understand now what is a loving relationship. Yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm in a loving relationship now. I'm not saying we never have our our Rounds. times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We all do. That's what relationships but are about. Yeah. I understand what boundaries are. I understand what self care is. What you know, yeah. self respect is. What respect for other people. And it's yeah. only when I look back now and I can find the words because back mm -hmm. then. You know, I remember when she, that lady, Caroline, her name was, gave me the leaflet. I was like, no, not me. You know, I'm an intelligent woman. I, I work, I've got a good full-time job. Do you know what I mean? You know, yeah, that, that's not me. Yeah. And I, I was carrying my, my own biases. So, you know, like when you say about yeah. you looking in, and it's and that's where, you know, I'm, I smiled earlier because I know exactly how that felt. Sure, that's not me. Yeah, not beaten black and blue. Well, actually, I was once, but I used to say just the once. Mm. It only hit me once. Minimize. But the threat was always there. The there. yeah, always, and that's how the police stepped in because they were on my voicemail, they were in my text, and that's even after I'd left him two years later. What the threats were in your text? Still, and your emails. yeah, yeah, still, okay. yeah. Right. The way he spoke to me that um became the norm yeah I want to pick up on two points really often if you've gone through abuse as a child young person and you don't know no different just let's go from that perspective yes. when you get into relationship and often all relationships start off loving friendly da 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 most relationships I would suggest start off like that and then the control takes over and then the abuse starts most. Um, the victim, if they've 
undergone previous abuses and their self-esteem is trashed, then all of a sudden they find themselves in what they think is a loving relationship. They don't know any difference. So like you were saying, us from the outside, we can look in, especially with 2020 hindsight, we can look <laughs> in and we can go, oh my God, that's coercive control. That is domestic violence. That is, that is, that is. But when you're in it and it's crept up on you and it's your norm, it's very hard to see the wood for the trees because you don't know no different. You And like you said, you didn't really know until someone handed you that leaflet. Yeah. And, and that was many years down the line as well. Yeah. And and so, the other thing, the other thing is as well, when we say that things were going so well, I was waiting for something to happen. Mm -hmm. But when I look back and, you know, this is being able to look back now because I had support. I can see that in some ways I was creating that because I wasn't thinking about my own needs. I was thinking about his needs. Do you sort of mean? I was trying to be the best wife, the you know, the best mum. And, you know, I now know that's that's not healthy. Yeah. Because you're yeah. you're trying, you're literally just trying to do everything and keep everything neat and tidy. It was like I'll keep it all there together. I'll control it all. And that's not life, is it? No, but also I, I felt growing up in the three domestic violence households that I grew up in, that I was always trying to keep the peace. And that's where the people pleasing came in because it was yeah. just like, if I just do that and if I just minimise myself here, if I just keep quiet now or if I just do that or do this, um, there'd be no backlash there no one will erupt there would be no abuse it, 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 everything will just remain calm but in fact that's not what a perpetrator wants they want chaos they want an excuse to perpetrate an act of violence whether it be mental physical in my opinion and in in my experience yeah um my stepdad for example if everything was going literally okay at home because everybody was treading on eggshells and trying to keep the peace he would create a situation that would cause something to happen and it was almost like see I told you so because he did it all and that's what makes so we're talking about recovery roller coaster so this is where the complexities of trauma come in layer upon layer upon layer and this is why as adults we get triggered by different things whether it is a smell a sound a sight um a gut instinct this is why the layers are so vast and why it's so complicated so when we're talking about adult safeguarding 100 percent do we want to protect adults from abuse and neglect but if they've already gone through all of this stuff as a child and young person and as a young adult, they've already got multiple layers of all of this impact that has to be dealt with. And that is why recovery is such a roller coaster. Absolutely, it's a roller coaster. And the other thing is the part of the roller coaster is when we start to have recovery, you know, like you've just completed an eight week workshop with um different survivors so you you and when I'm working with my clients I appreciate that we get all these tools we get all this knowledge and we think this is it now and off we go and then we start looking at other people and we can naturally see where they are and the hardest part is trying not to fix because we want to because we've been there we, we've we've seen the light we've yeah. we've understood oh if I do this and then we want to like save everyone else we don't want them to go through and sometimes we do that unknowingly to yeah. our own family to our children to our friends yeah. and that's part of the roller coaster because not everyone is ready to hear certain information yeah I always start off my course Bev and you know because you've been part of my course on several occasions like the information I'm sharing with you over the course of this eight weeks some of it will resonate with you. Some of it you will take on board because it speaks to you. 
but probably 80% of the calls right now will not speak to you, will not resonate with you. And you're probably thinking, what the hell am I learning this for? Okay. Until we recap on week eight, all of what we've learned as a individual, as a collective, and, and I keep reiterating, you might pick up on a bit of information, just one bit, that you'll act upon right now that will just take you a step further on your journey. But in five years time, you might go, oh, that woman said something to me back then. And that's when you'll act upon that bit of information. And I think that's where the magic is, is imparting the knowledge that you have, but also giving people permission to use what it is that speaks to them right now and hopefully more of it will speak to them as they go on their journey of recovery. And just as you said, everyone's journey is completely different. Um, the rates of taking on board the information and the action from that information given will be all at different times. And some people might even take a backward step because they think that they're further on in their journey than, that, than they are. And they come to some, of course, like mine or your client working with yourself and they go, oh, I thought I was here. But actually, I now find that something's come up for me that I actually now need to go back into counselling for. Yeah. So it really just depends on what what you've gone through, what support network have you got? And where on your journey are you? And it truly is a roller coaster. And we've spoke about this before when we it's like that tick box. Oh, I've done that. Tick, tick, tick. Done. No, I don't need to do any more. Thank you very much. And yeah. let's look at the word recovery. Recovery is ongoing. You know, yeah, I like okay. to say the word like journey or self-care because yeah. self-care, you know, until we can do it when we really need it, we haven't learned what self-care is. Until we can nurture ourselves, until we can give love to ourselves, how can we receive love? And if we've not been nurtured growing up and learned about nurturing, we've got to learn that ourselves. So this is where the, the journey comes. And, you know, we'll be 100% honest. You know, we've said this before. We support each other. We also have our own support outside we have to because life happens yeah you know yeah. and we have to make sure and take responsibility for ourselves yeah to yeah. look after ourselves yeah but that doesn't mean to say just because we're you know that we've done all this work oh yeah I skip and dance every single day but no. what's lovely the bit I do take and I don't know about you, Chris, the bit I do take reassurance from is all the work that I have done. Now, if I get to a place where it's bloody heavy, this shit yeah. I'm carrying around at the yeah. moment, I can actually take a deep breath, step back and say, okay, so what is it you're feeling? Yeah. How how does it feel? And I'm not scared of it. Yeah. Don't say I like it. Don't yeah. say I like it, but I'm not looking to run from it. But, you know, as you we work with adult individuals that have gone through childhood trauma, domestic violence, uh, as young people, as young adults. And we work with them in a holistic way, not to revisit their trauma, but to show yeah. them that they're worthy, that self-care is important, that they can go on and live the life that they truly want because we give them the tools to um, action and move on when they're ready so that's what we try and do with our work um but it's so many individuals over the years have said to me when does this all end why do I have to go through this you know why why is it my responsibility to do all of this work and it, it you can almost see them like deflate in front of you because it's just like yeah not only have they gone through abuse of all forms they've now got to put energy time and money into recovery that none of them want to do because they shouldn't have had to do it in the first place if the abuse had not been perpetrated against them in the first place they would not be spending 
their life trying to recover and trying to get on. So you can really see a lot of deep anger, deep resentment and just the heaviness of it all. And, you know, literally some survivors recently, recently as yesterday, is life really worth it? Yeah. yeah. When it really gets them down. And I don't always have an answer. All I can do is help them tap into their tools and just take literally hour by hour. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where one of the things, and I'll share this, because this is a tool that I have learned to use myself. And as we say before, people say about, oh, what tools can people use? It's not a one to 10. For some people no. it works, for some people it doesn't. But for me, I needed to find something that I could gauge myself. Um, and it's... Um, that gauging, you know, where am I between one and 10? Now, if you think of the emotional cup, one is the lowest, 10 is the highest. So if I was to tap in and think I'm at two, that means I'm so low, I have nothing else to give anybody else. There's I nothing. Else. I, exactly. I yeah. yeah. And when you're at that place of one, let's be honest, let's let's be frank here. When you're at one, you could, like, what am I able to do? So now I'm able to tap in and think, what level am I at? If I was to think I'm at level four, mm -hmm. okay, okay, what does four mean for me? That means I've got more in there, yeah. okay, and I can give a little bit out, but I'm on my way back down to one or two. Yeah. If yeah. I'm at one or two, and I have been in the past, yeah, it very much is, so what can I do for myself right now? Mm -hmm. Is it some food I want? Yeah. Is it, you know, is it support I need? Or do I need a hug from someone? Do I feel safe? They're yeah. the kind of things I'm looking at because mm -hmm. I'm trying to nurture myself. And even, and I had this conversation with someone recently, I've even used, you know how we talk about the post-it notes, et cetera, yeah. and I've, I've got, look, I've got my old ones. I pulled yeah. them out yesterday to show someone. And I remember this is a really old one. And it has actually got what does Beverly want? And it's got three right. kisses. Yeah. So when I've been that in that place years ago, that's how I did it. It's like, think of myself in the third place. Literally okay? post it at a time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what is it I want? Okay, I need some food. So... Yeah. Now, what I'm always checking into is, you know, like when we think glass half full. Yeah. So if I'm at level five, actually, I've got half a glass, That if that's yeah. how it feels. Yeah. So what one thing could I do for me to feel at level six? Yeah. Do I need to release something? Is there something I want to say? Do yeah. I want to journal with a pen? Do I want to type it out? Do you sort of mean? And yeah. it helps me get that level of where I am. Up a bit. But not as a judgment. Yeah. Not a, it's not a score. And that's, yeah. I'm saying level. It's yeah. not a score to be judged. Mm -hmm. Likewise, if I've been out and I'm having a fantastic time yeah. and I thought I'm at level nine or 10, fantastic. Maybe I had a great weekend, birthday, wedding or whatever. But then the next few days you come on that come down. Yeah. For a minute, there's that roller coaster feeling. Oh my God, I'm going down, I'm going down, I'm going down. Well, hold on. Are you? What level do you feel you're at? Oh, I actually feel like I'm at level seven. Okay. So, actually, what does level seven mean for you? Yeah. So, yeah. it's just to reassure myself that I'm not going down there. Yeah. And that's some people will be listening to that and, and want to hear more about that and if they don't understand please email in because I've been more than happy to help with that but what kind of tools do you work with yourself Chris this is going to sound um I don't know how it's going to sound but you know I'm quite blunt and quite strict back when I explain things so when I had my breakdown, for example, I knew what that felt like. Like that was me on the floor. Yeah. And I never, ever, ever, ever want to go there again because it's scary. I didn't know how I was going to pick myself up. And 
I never want to feel it again. So I know what that feels like. That's my ground zero. Yes. So anything above that, <laughs> <laughs> when I'm low, is magic. Yes. So I never want to go there. So I never allow myself to go maybe less than a four if you want to do a level one to ten. Yeah. yeah. Because I know that when my battery starts to run down from 10 to a four, when it gets to a four, that's like, right, listen to your brain, listen to your body. What is it telling you? What do you need to do? Yeah. And what I say to my groups, Bev, as well, over the course of the eight weeks is we've all gone through something and whatever that something is, because I never want to go back to details. Mm. Yeah, because we're not there for that. When you was a child and young person, you had no control over anything that happened to you. But as an adult now, you do. And I always make sure that when I say this, that no one's at, in current danger because it could obviously be a trigger. I said, you know what that felt like. As an adult now, you're not in any danger. This is your reality. So I make sure that this is a reality for everybody that's attending. And I say, you know what that felt like. You had no control. You are now an adult. You have control. And the reality is you are not in danger. You was then, but you're not now. So it don't matter how far you go down. It's never going to be as bad as that. Do you agree or do you not agree? And we have that conversation. And usually by the end of a conversation, they all are at a place where they agree that actually as an adult in a safe space for them, because none of them are in abusive situations mm -hmm. right now, they can see that no matter how much they get triggered by a false trigger, a false alarm, that they're not actually in danger and they're never going to go back to that place. So they already feel like they've grown a little bit. So I almost sort of like go back to the the bare bones and the basics of things and really be quite stark and blunt in my descriptions because I want them to truly understand that they have, even if they don't feel it, they have all moved on from the situation where there was no control and the reality was they were being abused and harmed. And that is no longer the situation. So now they have control and let's show them how to harness that and actually believe it. Does that make and sense? Absolutely. And this is the magic. So when I'm working with clients, most of my clients, especially if I'm one to one, we go on obviously longer. And the magical part about recovery is when somebody has been able to recognize it when the light bulb comes on, when they say, I felt myself, I got to level four, and then I thought, oh, hold on, what am I doing? They're able to check in, I'm at level four. What can I do? What do I need? Yeah. What do I want? Yeah. You know, and, and that could be anything, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And that may be going to a peer-to-peer -peer group, support group. Yeah. That may be speaking to a friend, or it may be going for a walk. But as you say, recognizing I'm getting low you know if I'm going lower than a four you know uh-uh no four is my you know yeah. I like to be between four and eight that's my yeah. so you can go up and down yeah, yeah because life happens yeah. <laughs> yeah but that's that's um the magic of recovery and I think this conversation is really useful especially as we're talking about safeguarding because when we think about safeguarding or I know I do and I know in conversations we automatically assume well oh, people should be able to ask but even in adulthood they can't for lots of different reasons yeah. so safeguarding is about also raising awareness mm -hmm. so that we understand you know and we see that around us all the time look at exploitation yeah yeah yeah, you know. but you know, safeguarding though, Bev, if you've got the awareness, then you can safeguard yourself, you can safeguard your loved ones, okay? Yeah. But we're also talking about safeguarding in the context of organisations and their duty of care to their service users. Yeah. Um, 
uh, or to their employees, what, whatever situation it is. And you just need to look across social media, mainstream media, people sharing their lived experiences. And there are so many bystanders to acts of safeguarding concern because people just do not have either the confidence, the know-how, or they have reported concerns, yet it gets blocked. So all of this safeguarding needs to be part of culture and needs to be led by leadership. So embedded in the culture, leadership needs to be very clear about what it looks like, how people can whistle blow and not get penalised and what it looks like to actually be an upstander and not a bystander to sexual harassment, to exploitation, to domestic violence, whatever the situation is, we need to have a stark conversation with ourselves at a societal level and just go, you know what, no more. We're not yeah. bystanding, we're upstanding, no. we're saying no. Because Absolutely. we've explained this whole podcast about the layers and the complexity of the harm, the impact of that harm. It's ongoing, it's lifetime, yeah? And if we do not sort us adults out by breaking the cycle to step forwards, we've got another generation of children and young people coming up and going through exactly the same. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think you've, you've really brought that to a conclusion in a really great way. So my last, my last sort of closing on this would really be, you know, when we're talking about safeguarding, like really open your mind to self, self-guarding and be aware of your unconscious bias because we all have that let's yeah, be have, let's be frank we humans. all have that yeah absolutely we judge. Yeah. yeah yeah and and judgment keeps us safe sometimes but when it when it means that it's putting people in danger let's just stop with the judgment let's look at it the other, other side let's ask questions yeah and like you said judgment can be silencing to other people that are going through something because we don't actually understand it because we're not in their shoes. Yeah. And I've been there. I've judged. I judged my mum. Yeah. For yeah. a long, long time. And I still don't get all of it. I really don't um, from my perspective as a victim yeah. as well. Um, but as you said, open your mind. Yeah. 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 So any other questions with anybody listening to this, our email, the link will always be underneath, but it's breaking the cycle to step forward. And we'd love you to to send us questions if you want any clarification one last any last thoughts from yourself Chris no I just wanted to share with everybody that you and I we do presentations and talks for organizations we've just been involved in a safeguarding um presentation conference, conference yeah and we've got that presentation. It's ready to rock and roll for any other organisations that might want to hear from us. So I just wanted to share that here for people to contact us as well. And one thing I'm going to say, we were actually the keynote speakers. Oh, yes, I keep forgetting that. <laughs> yes, you're right. Yeah. Um, for many, yeah. many practitioners within the social care aspect. Yeah. which is um and it's interactive which is which we always enjoy we open that conversation with many so thank you for the for that and and it's time to say goodbye okay everyone until next time au revoir bye for now bye bye <laughs>